Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure um, for a couple of reasons that I will explain. First, a few words about myself. I joined GM two years ago. I lead mm -hmm. the um, uh, software-defined vehicle architecture for, for the company, so that's covering vehicle hardware and software, the cloud and mobile, and how everything uh, interconnects. And in the last two years, we've been very busy building um, our first software defined vehicles. And it's going to be a journey, but um, we're almost ready for uh, shipping code in production. And so that's that's an important milestone for us. But that doesn't relate to Eclipse. Uh, what does relate to Eclipse is that throughout this journey uh, of these last couple of years, we've realized that we can create everything ourselves you know we're a big company we have uh, people but it's not very it's not the best way it's not it's not how we want to proceed um, maybe it's the way it was done in the past of be autonomous uh, autonomous vehicles also autonomous companies and developments but um, no we um, by migrating into this software world we also want to adopt some of uh, the practices that have made software industry uh, very productive and that means cooperating more cooperating not only by sharing ideas but also by sharing code and contributing code to the industry and this is why i'm here today is actually to join eclipse as a community so to become a member and be part of a community that uh, is building an ecosystem of technologies that can be shared, that can be shared in production, and not only as a participant, but as a contributor. It's very important for us to contribute and, and foster more contributions to enrich what we've um, designed, what we'll contribute to um, uh, expect improvements, enhancements, enlargement of what we've done, and in return also, and not in return, but complementary to that, ourselves also adapt some of the technologies that we see out there and that are relevant for us. So that's why I'm very excited to uh, to be here. So our first uh, contribution is um, is named U protocol and the underlying sentence is uh, is important. It's uh, U protocol is really about connecting automotive apps and services everywhere and hopefully throughout this presentation you will understand what this is about um, and why we believe it. it's an important, um, let's say, foundation for building an ecosystem and, uh, and gluing things together. By the way, if you have questions, please raise your hands. It's much better if it's interactive and more of a discussion than me talking for. Actually, we made it two projects, so I have 40 minutes and not 20 minutes. <laughs> So um, first word on, you know, what challenge are we um, are we solving with uh, or are we addressing? And everybody knows that, so I'm not going to spend that much time on it, but the automotive industry and OEMs have been designing highly complex products made of tens of ECUs interconnected, communicating and delivering, you know, um, what we know as uh, vehicles. But the software is really helping the hardware deliver uh, the resulting feature. So it's a hardware centric approach and the whole industry, the whole supply chain um, is geared and optimized for designing these kind of architectures. Now, when we talk about software defined vehicles, this is the right hand side. You know, the left hand side, you see the internal of the architecture. So when you're desi designing software, Everything is dependent on the underlying hardware. When you're designing a software defined vehicle, you want, you know, most of your asset become the software and you don't want to redesign the software every year and for every model and for OEMs that have multiple brands to design one version for each um, for for each model. So you really have a paradigm shift in how you design vehicles from you know, very hardware centric, every all the hardware details are exposed to the software into a world where, um, you know, you want to protect your software from 
the underlying hardware so that it can migrate. Um, you want and you want your customers to have the look and feel and uh, the experience that they're now used uh, by with uh, using mobile phones or PCs or any smart device really. So you want that same experience. And at the same time, the underlying uh, hardware we evolved to support these software trends and with a lot more compute, we also need to design the hardware differently so that it sustains the software evolution and the software productivity that we need given the massive amount of software that we have inside. So that's our challenge as an OEM and as I guess all OEMs is how do we ensure that transition beyond the OEMs as an industry, how do we ensure that transition and all of us still remain relevant in that new world that we're creating that will be very different from what we've known up to now. So our vision is actually to start with much broader than uh, vehicles. You know, up to now, the left hand side of the previous slide was the, the architecture of the vehicle. Now the vehicle is one device of out of an ecosystem that we want to build. And that ecosystem is a fleet of vehicles, millions of vehicles connected to the cloud, potentially to multiple clouds, mobile phones connected to that network of vehicles and cloud environment, customer mobile phones you may, may have for fleet management, you may have uh, fleet managers, you may have other um, partners connecting to that interconnected uh, system of devices. And this is the new world. It's not about designing vehicle. And by the way, vehicle themselves are a network of devices. So if you zoom into the vehicle, you also have a network of um, compute islands that need to communicate. And so the question is, how do we build that environment where software is running on vehicles, is running on cloud, multiple cloud environments, mobile phones, um, poss possibly other devices like charge prints or other related devices that contribute to the automotive ecosystem. And you have tens of millions of those devices just for one OEM, let alone, you know, the industry overall. And the software is if it's distributed software, you know, the best approach is you have services, some software components delivering services, other software components using those services to deliver, um, let's say, customer features. And they're all spread. So you can have services and apps inside the vehicle. You can have them in the cloud, on mobile, a mobile phone on any device. And um, now each device is different, is built differently, has a different operating system within the vehicle. You will have deeply embedded systems with classic Autozar, others with adaptive Autozar, others with only Linux or Android, multitude of operating systems, multitude of um, languages, Cloud is also the same. You have mobile phones, so here diversity is only, let's say, two platforms, but still. So um, when we're writing software, we want to be productive in that diverse environment. And at the same time, we want this distributed software to be connected and exchanging the data to deliver uh, customer features as needed. So that's our vision. That's what we um, we embarked on that journey two years ago. And when we embarked on that journey, we thought, you know, what I, the previous slide is is um, nothing new under the sun, really. If you look at the internet to start with, you know, when you type CNN.com, you're accessing a service. It's a web service. You're sending a request. You're getting back back the web page. So you have a service. Your your web browser is the app. And so what's new? You know, it's uh, it's been around for decades, and it's working very well. Um, well, as it happens, um, our world is more complicated because 
you know, um, we have local services within within the vehicles. Some of the services are remote behind firewalls or not. Uh, some uh, some devices are not accessible. For example, if you connect your if you want to connect your mobile to your vehicle, you can't cross telecom boundaries like that easily. So um, yes, it's the same, but it's also different. IoT networks are very similar to what we want to build. You know, when you have millions or billions of devices connected to the cloud and uploading data, it's somehow what we want to do, right? We want to have our vehicles uploading data that we can capitalize on, analyze and, and use. Well, vehicles are not typical IoT devices, right? Typical IoT devices are very small. They're only uploading data most of the time. They're not downloading data. Vehicles are very heavy users of data. They have huge amounts of compute and uh, they are communicating not only with the cloud, but for, with other devices like customers mobiles. So yes, it's the same, but it's different. So not directly applicable. And last but not least, you know what? Well, most OEMs have connected vehicles today. Most vehicles somehow can have the capability to connect to the cloud. So it's already existing, you could say. Yes, it is existing, but it's very, very tedious. It's It requires a lot of efforts, a lot of custom work. Every feature requires um, manual work and um, it's not efficient. So what we want to summarize is we want to leverage all of these technologies. We don't want to reinvent our own thing just for the automotive industry or just for GM. So we want to adapt, but we also understand we will need to adapt um, those technologies to match our requirements and to build the vision that I described earlier. We want no lock-in. Uh, we, if, you know, open source, there is sometimes a confusion between um, open source and proprietary. You, you can use an open source software, but be locked with a specific vendor if only one vendor fully controls that software. And so um, we don't want to lock in into any specific vendor. And that's one big reason why we're joining Eclipse is we see Eclipse as, as um, a community where we can drive and commonly use and adapt standards that are not driven by one specific vendor. The last is we want the, our solution to scale. We want it to scale across all our, our models across years. We want uh, the solution to be a good foundation that we can evolve uh, for years because um, the requirements that we have cannot be fulfilled, you know, with the first release. So it's it's a journey, and so we want our solution to scale for the years to come. So when we looked around at the technologies, we found many technologies, all of them partially relevant. Like Autozar, obviously, is very widely used and has uh, communication protocols like some IP that are relevant. Uh, MQTT, when you want to connect your uh, device to the cloud and you, you know, send telemetry data or stuff like that is very relevant. Obviously, Linux, Android, so all of these technologies that, you know, the, uh, earlier there was a presentation that mentioned DDS. We also looked at DDS. So all of these technologies are part of a puzzle. They have a place in that puzzle, but they're isolated islands of solutions. And what we wanted to, uh, what we were looking for is a way to have consistency, a way to glue all of these technologies together because when we want to have, um, you know, a uh, an application running on your mobile phone, accessing a service running into the mechatronics layer of your vehicle, it's crossing many boundaries. Uh, your phone is probably connected to the cloud. The cloud is connected to the vehicle. In the vehicle, you have a telematics gateway that goes to uh, the mechatronics layer that accesses. Um, you know, the um, the mechatronic service that, that you want. And all of these, 
are built using different environments, but we wanted to build a consistent environment across all of these technologies and all of these layers. And so um, that's how we came up with that idea of defining a protocol that um, that is really the glue between all of these technologies that can be used um, as, as um, a consistency layer across all of these technologies to connect apps to services, uh, regardless of where um, the service is running and regardless of where the application is, is running. So U protocol is not the universal solution that will solve all, all of your problems, but it does solve an important problem, at least that we had within GM and I'm, I'm assuming and suspecting many OEMs uh, are facing, which is to connect um, apps and services running in a highly distributed environment and heterogeneous, heterogeneous environment. Sure. It's for you. <laughs> Okay, so um, a bit more technical details and Stephen Hartley, who's here with me uh, uh, from GM as well, we're working together uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, we'll go into more details, more technical details. I'm here to give you kind of the background of how we came up with the uh, U protocol and what problems we're trying to solve and what problems we're not trying to solve uh, when uh, we introduce U protocol. So, um, a few properties of U protocol. First, to remind, it's a communication protocol, but it's not meant to replace TCP or UDP or HTTP. It's meant to add a layer. And so, uh, it has a number of properties. First, it's location independent. We don't want application developers to have to deal with where is the service that I'm trying to access running and understanding how they need to route their request in order for the request to reach the destination and the response to go back to uh, the, the requester. So um, when you're defining a service, uh, it's exposed to anyone on this environment, on this connected network of uh, devices. Second is we needed a generic way to define the location of a service. And so we adapted URI uh, as, as the, um, let's say, the schema for defining a service. And I'm giving you an example here where uh, you see, you know, you have, it, it's, it's fully compliant with URI. So you have the authority if you want, if not, then it's, it will look at the, the system will look it up for you. Uh, then you define the service, you define the version, you define exactly what you want to subscribe or access. And, and, and so the protocol doesn't define you, it doesn't define the, the services themselves, but it defines how you define the service. And then that definition is used to route the requests. Um, the framework itself is really uh, based on a service-oriented architecture, obviously because we have apps and services that want to communicate, um, but it's um, it's an event-based uh, architecture, meaning that uh, we are leveraging um, event propagation and event routing to implement the various design patterns that we want to support for communication. And so far, we've identified three that um, are enough for us. One is PubSub. So, if you want, to, if you have a service who's publishing information, anyone can subscribe and be, uh, uh, let's say, receive the information whenever an information is published. The second one is notification. So, in that case, um, a service is able to notify a specific set of uh, applications that need to be informed by the service of a given event. And the third one is RPC, um, most, um, mostly for sending commands. 
So these are the three design patterns that we're supporting in your protocol so far. And together with these design patterns, uh, other important mechanisms that we implemented is authentication and permissions for access control uh, and security. We wanted to have security and access control at the core of the mechanism, given the intrinsic open nature of the environment we're building, we wanted to have built-in mechanisms for controlling who's, um, who has the right to access uh, the specific data or the specific services. In terms of data that can be exchanged, we define three types and the, the reason for these three types is that they're managed differently by the framework. One is standard messages. Um, these are, you know, uh, you would say MQTT standard messages or DDS. The second one is uh, file transfers, which is really uh, messages with attachment. So we are still leveraging the same message framework, um, but this is also transferring files um, transparently and independently. And, and so there will be a lot more details available later. And the last one is uh, video transfers, again, using the same um, the same framework and reusing the same framework is really important because it takes a lot of effort to define and build a robust framework and we didn't want to do it three times or four times, basically one, uh, one time for each design pattern that we needed to support. So that's why we, we have an event-based mechanism that we use to implement the different patterns and send all types of information through that network. Last but not least, um, our environment is very diverse. We have many brands, uh, many models. These models of evolve over, over the years and um, we want the same piece of software to run across all of these vehicles, which means that the same piece of software has to adapt itself to different vehicles or to different customers um, environment. And so the discovery is the mechanism that we've defined to store the configurability of all of our vehicles and all our environments that are queryable by the software components, basically the apps and services so that when you install an app or a service on your vehicle, it can query the capability of the vehicle so that the same software will run on any vehicle and not try to open the rear door if there is no rear door, as an example. Any question here? All good. That part I will skip. I will let for Stephen to go into the details. Just remember that we've built the protocol in layers so that we can separate uh, problems and address them um, separately, solving them independently, but in an interoperable way. And that gives us a lot of flexibility. I mentioned that we want to, um, we want to build a foundation that we can evolve and support different environments. When you have, if we want to support different protocols, we don't want when we change from, I don't know, some IP to MQTT to have to rewrite the rest of the application stack and the protocol stack. So that's why we designed layers to, um, uh, to support that, that diversity. And this will be my last slide and then I will uh, open for questions. Um, so we are here because we, we believe that um, We've, we're contributing something that so far we didn't find, and that's why we had to um, um, invent it or develop it. And hopefully um, that contribution can be the basis for uh, additional work, additional integration between existing projects and this U protocol, expanding U protocol to support uh, more transport layers, more protocols, beyond what we're supporting today. Um, support more operating systems 
either vehicle operating systems, mobile operating systems, support different cloud environments. Um, we can build productivity tools to help us be more efficient in developing software. And finally, um, once we have that framework in place and available, uh, we can think of developing apps and services that can be shared across uh, companies, um, you know, commercially, non-commercially is, uh, is independent, but at least we have a common framework that, um, that we can use to, um, to, have, to connect apps and services in a consistent way. And so this is a call for cooperation um, this is also a core for contributing to U protocol itself. Uh, this is, as I mentioned earlier, to us, this is uh, the beginning of the road, not the end of the road. We have many more features in mind that we want to add, uh, either within the protocol or as, let's say, um, tooling or services around what we've uh, defined. Um, and we're welcoming ideas and contribution in uh, what we're contributing. Thank you. Yes, so uh, thank you, Stephen. So, there's a color code that I didn't uh, explain. The dark or let's say the black are what we're contributing. So we're contributing two projects. One is um, the SDK, which is the foundation. It includes the specification of the protocol and basic libraries to, uh, to construct um, headers and payloads that are necessary to send messages uh, through the framework or through the, um, the infrastructure. It also includes test files. So it includes everything that you need if you want to support your protocol on the new operating system, on the new language, um, then that's the starting point. And so that's kind of the foundation. And this is, uh, so that's the first project. Obviously that's not enough to be the product. Um, so for our own needs, we've implemented that specification in a number of environments, and one of them is actually Android. And so that's the second project that uh, we are contributing, which is an implementation of U protocol running on Android. And um, that implementation of U protocol on Android is actually embedding uh, first a transport layer that is based on binder because uh, Android is using binder to connect um, processes together. And MQTT because our Android U protocol needs to be able to talk to uh, um, our vehicle apps and services um, in particular in the cloud and that's using MQTT. Doesn't mean you have to use MQTT, but if you happen to use MQTT, that's one way that you can use to um, to have apps and services communicating over uh, internet, and so this is our uh, these are our two contributions, hence two projects. But again, there is a lot more that can be done in this space. Question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, when I see here um, your protocol for Android, does it mean um, is it an Android service or something running on the framework? Yeah, th it's this is right. This these are um, as Stephen will explain tomorrow. In order to implement U protocol on a device, you need to have um, a set of core services that are running on that device to enable routing of events basically and discovery of the service location that is a prerequisite to know where you have to route these events and so uh, when we say you protocol on android that means we've implemented those services as basically as uh, processes running on top of the android framework and exposed 
um, as um, you know through AI DL interface. You know you, you can connect to the uh, to the framework using some AI DL interfaces, and then the content you're transferring is compliant to U protocol, and then leveraging the services that are defined using U protocol to access um let's say services and send commands and do what you protocol uh, can do thank you this means it's a collection of services running on the android system and uh, generally every application developer needs to to implement the api yeah so it, it's actually published as um, um apis that you know it, it, so if you you're developing an android application and you want to connect you want to use your protocol that means you will connect to a software bus basically so um, that means we developed a software bus running on android and together with a software bus you have to have a subscription manager and you have to have a discovery manager so that you can subscribe to events you can query information about configuration of your vehicle and stuff like that and so these are Android components packaged as APKs that um, that are you can install on your Android device uh, if you want to develop U protocol compliant applications. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, for vehicle abstraction, are you considering? Um, are you ag agnostic, or is something like pervasive ESS or Ebagi DTTL uh, being considered in the in the protocol itself? Yeah, but, but thank you for that question. Um, so, your protocol itself is agnostic to how you define the services, and that always in what we in what we've architecture and in particular you protocol, we. Uh, do our best to do uh, to separate concerns. So to have a modular architecture so that we can solve one problem in a modular way that doesn't uh, implicitly force us to solve other problems with the same mindset. So here, the problem we're solving is connecting apps and services. How you define services, where are those services is outside of you protocol. Obviously, if you don't have services, you don't have much because you have a protocol to connect apps and services and no services. So, so you do need services. And um, I think as part of the overall industry effort, we do need to come up with a set of standard services in, and avoid having every OEM and every tier one and everybody reinventing their own services, at least for those standard ones. And Covisa is a very good place as an example to, to do that. So you could imagine having um, U-Protocol compliant Covisa or VCS, VSS services, um, but we left it as um, complementary technologies. Thank you. Test. Yeah, since the microphone is so close to me, I thought I'd take this opportunity. Um, so there is this bubble productivity with uh, VS Code, Eclipse, uh, IntelliJ, and so on. Um, is that something you already provide as, in terms of extensions to support users or, or developers, and, or is it on your roadmap? So anything that's great, uh, just ideas I threw on the slide, you know, ideas that hopefully some, some of you will pick up, uh, but not in our uh, roadmap. Okay, okay. And Thanks. Or oh, some of them are, but they're so far proprietary, and we don't we don't have any plans to expose them. Uh, how would somebody go about if you wanted to secure a connection over UP? Would it, would that be left to the application? Would it be done in UP, or would it be done in one of the? It, it, so so it's comp again it's complementary, and uh, um, so we it would be um, done at the lower layer. Uh, using, you know, uh, TLS or anything that uh, that is appropriate. So we don't address the um, the protection of the communication because we assume that the protocol that uh, we're supporting at the transport layer itself is capable of doing a secure transmission. All right. Okay, one more question for me. 
Um, from a real case scenario, um, for example, I have an application that uh, speaks the Android AIDL language. It connects to the Android Automotive OS HAL uh, API, and it also wants to connect to a REST service, so HTTP communication. Would the U protocol help me to be the adapter, the one and only, to communicate via all of those APIs? Did I get it correctly? So if you have a REST API that's already existing and implemented, you have an API. So yeah, that's it. So what we're solving here is if you don't have an API, if you don't have an implementation, especially one that's crossing all of the domains that I mentioned, what you have to do currently, what we have to do, and I guess everybody has to do is if you want to communicate to the cloud, probably you're going to use a REST API. Then if you want to communicate to the vehicle, probably you're going to use, I don't know, MQTT. And then within the vehicle, okay, maybe you're going to use DDS. And if you're within Android, you're going to use AIDL. And every time you cross a boundary, you have to redo the work. You have to reinvent a way to create the bridge and maybe transform the data. And that's very tedious and very error prone. So you can either continue doing that or you can use U protocol as the glue logic or as the glue um, that enables to create. You, you still have to create the bridge, but you only create it once and that's it. And then once that bridge is, is built, any service will just flow throughout the system and any application and service developer will not have to take care of that problem anymore. So we solve the problem once and then it it helps or it enables apps and services to connect without understanding how it's done under the hood. Okay, thanks. So for the um one thing for, for the security, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm not aware of TLS for some IP. Am I right? Anybody knows that? As far as I know, there's no TLS for some IP. Secrecy. Yeah, but oh, okay. Um, that, and the next question. And the other one is um, for the discovery. You so always. One question at a time. Let me. I'm not sure it was a question, but I'll answer it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That sounds good. So the, the answer is. Well, again, we're not trying to solve every problem. So if you That's want fine. to use a protocol that doesn't support secure communication, well, you can't do secure communication over U protocol. We don't take on the job of adding a secure layer. So if you use some IP and it, it can't sec uh, have a secure communication, at least to your analysis, then that means you, you know, U protocol won't solve it for you. Um, and regarding that, do you see the protocol more as an external communication protocol or internal? So inter inside the vehicle or more external because most of this are, I guess, external service? No, actually no. Um, and that's what I tried to show uh, with the first, with this one. Uh, it, it's kind of, we, we've, um, we see our world as a flattened world. So in vehicle, outside of the, of the vehicle, you have each service running anywhere on that network will have a unique address, a unique URI, and is accessible by anyone connected to that network, including apps and services running within the vehicle. Okay, that's, that's a good point. Where I look next to, how do you connect it? Because well, MQT, obviously, you have kind of central broker for some IP, kind of the sale is, is kind of the same. For HTTP, I guess there has to be a complete own solution for that. So is there always some kind of central entity then everybody has to connect, no. especially for those discovery stuff? No, so um, it's actually a distributed network of software buses and a distributed um, set of databases that store the location of the services and the apps and so we 
the routing is incremental. It, it's it's a bit like um, you know on internet you have DNS servers and you have a hierarchy of DNS servers, so that help you route the packets. So here is is using the same principle. Okay, and the for example you mentioned on the uh, on after the, all the things you did for the ACL or for the authoriz authorization, mm -hmm. you're using then the protocol specifics. So for example, MQTT you would use MQTT authentication, or you're introducing your own authentication. So because, so the so, pro so again because it's a specification. The specifications uh, requires the transport layer to securely authenticate the two sides of the point-to-point -point communication. And because we we are chaining point-to-point, point-to-point, point-to-point from application to service, we can guarantee the end-to-end -end authentication. Now, how you implement and what guarantees the authentication of the point-to-point is left to the implementation and the, the specific protocol you're using in between each two software entities. So the so how you implement it is implementation dependent. How you guarantee it is by complying to the requirement that every two software components that are connected point to point have to be securely authenticated or identified. Okay, in the end that would mean I have to implement my own MQT broker or at least extended. Um, you can, well, you don't have to use your own MQTT broker, or but you, you can, but you can also use other chef. But you have to, uh, you have to comply with the number of requirements that the protocol requires you to implement. That's how we can guarantee that an end-to-end -end, uh, guarantee of delivery and guarantee of um, authentication of the apps in the service. Okay, thank you. I'll ask a silly question. Um, there are no silly questions. Why two projects? Why not a project with multiple modules? Again, modularity. Uh, I mean, we could have bundled everything together, uh, sure. But uh, next next guy who comes and say, oh, I want to implement U protocol on QNX. So, okay, we add it, and then next one on Linux, and we add it. And if we have two implementations of U protocol on Linux, one based on DDS, the other based on MQTT, just make it up, um, then what do we do? And it becomes a huge thing. So that's why we, we prefer to separate first, isolate the specification and, and the core, the foundation of what U protocol is, and separate that from the instantiation of the protocol, the implementation of the protocol for a given environment. Yeah, I, I understand that question, but more why, as an organization of projects, why do you choose to have two separate package projects as opposed to uh, an umbrella project? Yeah. For the reason I explained. Uh, I have two questions from the online attendees. Okay. So uh, someone asks, Gabriel and Carlos uh, from Zeta Scale, they ask the same question. This is very similar to a project in the Edge Working Group. Have you heard of Eclipse Zeno? Eclipse what? Zeno. No. No? Okay. Uh, second question from Rex, is Google Protobuf the only message serialization standard that is supported? Uh, what about local IPC? What about what? Local IPC. Yes. Um, so the protocol is structured. We're using cloud events and um, cloud events as any, I guess, communications protocol is splitting the header that is needed to basically route the information from the actual payload. And so the payload can be, you know, defined using anything. We decided to use protobuf. Um, others could define their own um, their own format. Um, we could think of using some IP format. Um, so the protocol itself doesn't mandate you to use protobuf. That's that's a choice we've made for our services. Obviously, if we want to um, to support multiple uh, multiple either serialization formats or formats, you know, payload formats we would need to have 
uh, translators and bridges that are able to translate from one format to another in, a, in order to ensure interoperability. Um, and we, we chose Protobuf because it was ubiquitous, widely supported. Um, it comes with its own problems that we were discovering, but it also has its own advantages. So, so far we only support uh, Protobuf for the payloads not mandated by the protocol that's that's only our our choice we could think of supporting multiple ones but that if we want to ensure interoperability that would require making sure that we can transfer from one format to another now for the second question about ipc the protocol doesn't mandate um, um and i'll answer in a kind of a detoured way uh, the protocol itself doesn't mandate you to implement it in a broker or brokerless approach. Um, you can, it doesn't mandate you to use, um, let's say, a standard communication protocol, be it UDP or TCP or HTTP or whatever. It, it's, it's a transport layer decision. And one of the transport layer that you can choose is, is an IPC mechanism. You can choose sockets. You, we, for Android, we, uh, we use binder. Uh, you can use any IPC mechanism as long as it complies to some, um, uh, to some requirements. One of them being to secure the, or to authenticate both sides uh, of the point-to-point the -point connection. Thanks a lot. So is there any other question to this project? Because we have a, actually I do it's have, related. yeah, it's related, but okay. Uh, so the communication performance of some IP is not as good as DDS. So some OEMs try to switch from some IP to DDS and combine with adaptive AutoSAR. For the P3COM, is it possible to integrate into adaptive AutoSAR COM module? So this is in part for the P3COM project as well. We could follow up. Exactly. Uh, Recom is not me. I cannot answer. <laughs> yeah. So, anyone has an answer to that? Yeah. Yeah. And. Um, Let's just say yes, it hasn't been something we've, we've done so far, but yeah, that would be possible. Yeah. It, it's not there yet, but it is planned. Not planned. Not planned. Okay. Just. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah, then uh, I was actually interested in um, in the previous talks about uh, ICE rocks, ICE, ICE, ICE Oryx and P3COM and all of these mechanisms are actually uh, at the layer one of, um, of the U protocol and we could take advantage of any mechanism that will optimize uh, event transfers from one point to another. And um, for some applications and some environments, um, throughput and latency is not so much of an issue, but for others and especially for high high throughput compute like an ADA system, it is very important. And and in these environments, paying attention to um, the performance of the communications framework is really important and something that we've been paying attention a lot uh, to uh, to implement new protocol for these dedicated devices. Questions still in one of the slides, the, the one with the overall ecosystem. You show also one adapter to adaptive auto uh, You protocol AA. No, if you go to the ecosystem slide, the the, the latest you show. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I can see the UPAA in yeah. the vehicle. Mm -hmm. It's I think it's referred to adaptive. Yes, correct. Okay. Do you have already some ideas about how to interoperate with adaptive since adaptive at least uh, to the COM module is trying to do more or less uh, what you are trying to do, but uh, locally to to the vehicle itself. So uh, at the end, uh, 
for adaptive is not a matter of transport protocol, but they are also defining the top layer. Mm -hmm. Um, not specifically for adaptive autosomal, I can tell you we're uh, deeply looking into some IP and its discovery mechanism and how we can uh, integrate it uh, within your protocol or let's say have an, an instance of your protocol running, um, let's say based on some IP. Um, so that we're looking at, but for adaptive autosomal. No. Yeah, so there's a question also from the online audience. Uh, do you have any metrics on your performance? And which follows up to a question I also want to ask is you are implementing this in vehicle, right? So this is like production grade software, uh, which relates to the metrics. How are you making sure? How are you validating it? And uh, where are you? Where are you with the process itself? So. I don't have numbers for performance for the simple reason that um, it really depends on the implementation. What we're contributing here are two things. The protocol itself and the protocol doesn't have performance numbers by itself because, you know, if you're using a broker or broadcast, if you're using shared memory or sockets or over TCP or even UDP, you will have very different performance levels. Um, so the the uh, the foundation itself has um, no associated KPIs because because it, uh, the, the spec cannot be associated with these KPIs. The um, uh, Android implementation um, does have performance numbers. I don't have them in mind, and they will be published with the um, when we will contribute the code. What I can say is that we didn't see any. Um, uh, bottleneck in in all of what we've used it for so far. And can you say something about the automotive grade, how the automotive readiness? Yeah, so uh, obviously U protocol on Android is is uh, is QM only, is not AZLB. Um, we are working on versions that uh, actually are second generation will cover a broader set of um, uh, use cases and domains, including uh, active safety related uh, software. And therefore, U-Protocol will be implemented on devices that do support or that are ACLB compatible. Uh, but again, the spec doesn't dictate or mandate or require safety features, but the, depending on how you implement it, it is or it is not, um, let's say, uh, safety certifiable. Okay, yeah. I can do it so. Uh, with all respect, and I don't want to, 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 to sound as a meme, but I just, you say, say it, you, just say it. <laughs> <laughs> you say you're, you're, not, you're not defining the actual serialization. You're not defining actual transport protocol. What are you then actual defining? I'm I'm missing the point. Then. Maybe I'm just lost and I don't understand it. But yeah, I don't. No, know. no, that, that that's a very that's a very good point. Very very fair point. Uh, f first, um, we're not defining the payload here. By the way, actually, if you look at any. Um, uh, any framework, DDS, MQTT, whatever you want, nobody is defining the um, uh, the payloads. So we don't define the payload. What we do define is a mechanism to specify um, um, addresses for services and the mechanisms that enable routing across diverse uh, services, uh, across diverse devices that have different operating systems, different languages, and ensuring that end-to-end -end you can connect an app and a service. That, that's the focus of U protocol. And again, we're not solving all problems. We're solving a specific problem, which is like connecting apps and services that are in very running in very different environments in a consistent way. So this is the, the, the yes. 
something that's well, it, it's not most important. It, it's part of the specification. Um, but for example, when you how do you uh, manage uh, permissions or how do you implement an RPC mechanism on top of a messaging framework, knowing that 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 RPC call might go, you know, if you if you uh, call this RPC from mobile and it's reaching the mechatronics layer because you want to unlock the door. How do you do that? How do you do that knowing that it, it starts from Android or from iOS? It goes in the cloud environment, has all of uh, all kinds of infrastructure. You have to route it to the vehicle, to the thematic gateway, then reach the mechatronics layer, do the stuff, send it back, all of that in a consistent way that is transparent to the developer. That's that's what your protocol is about. It's not about how you, how do you define, you know, um, a body access service which is controlling the doors and the windows and all of that. We have that as well. Obviously, you know, we can't we wouldn't have <laughs> a vehicle that that we can operate without that. But that's not the contribution we're we're having here. And that, and again, to to us, what's really important is we want to have focused contribution. So we're not trying to solve everything. That's the problem we're solving with you protocol. So maybe that's not enough, but that that's the. <laughs> okay. okay. I'd say we are good on time. So okay. thank you a lot and thanks for all the